Um, Tessa, let's start with you. Um, like this, is, this is very interesting because there have been lots of adaptations of Alistair MacLean novels, but this was an ad Alistair MacLean screenplay that he was approached and invited to, to write. Could you, could you talk about the background, please? Well, I was very lucky because um, Elliot, I was actually dating him. He's married to somebody else. Um, and, uh, and this but, is just the start of a conversation. <laughs> But uh, Alistair MacLean happened to be um, uh, from a tiny village in Scotland, which was very near to where I lived, Daviot, who was. And uh, my stepfather was a member of parliament for Inverness. So uh, we had a connection in a way. I'd never met him before, but uh, Elliot thought we'd, would warm up the room by having somebody with him who, who would... Um, and pretty, she was pretty cute, too. I think you were actually cuter than the... This was 50 years ago. Ah. I might have been there. She just turned 80 in December. Yeah. So go on. Sorry to interrupt. That's a really bad family trait. Um, well, and Elliot, Elliot had this... Um, he was an avid reader. He would spend all night reading. It was unbelievable. Never turned off the light. It was difficult to sleep. Um, but he, he had this quote from Shakespeare, Where Eagles Dare, and he was determined to make a film with that title. And... This is it. Amazing. Yeah. He gave it to Alistair and said, please, that's it. Now, one of the other stories I've heard is that um, Elliot knew Richard Burton, and Richard Burton had said to him that the films he was making, his children were annoyed with because they couldn't see them, either because he died in them yes. or that they were too arty for well, them. I, I actually don't know much about that. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, just, just in terms of the archive um, that people can see outside, um, I've had been lucky enough to spend the last week looking through it and reading all the telegrams and the various uh, correspondences back and forth. And um, one of the things that really stunned me um, was the, not just the casting, where it may have been Marlon Brando at one point playing yeah. the uh, Clint Eastwood part. Yeah. Um, and I believe Nicole Williamson was going to play the Richard Burton part. But there were so many actors. Um, Claudia Cardinale at one point was playing the Mary Eo part. Um, and even directors, David Lean, Carol Reed, John Houston. Lots of directors. All in discussion. Um, I'm just wondering, with the both of you, as you've worked through this archive and read through things, uh, have there been any great surprises for you that you, you've discovered? Um, yes, that they didn't have te mobile phones or WhatsApp groups. <laughs> um, I'm, and I was, I'm actually so glad, because I grew up with my dad on like both phones bullshitting Marlon Brando and going, I got Clint Eastwood, I mean, Richard Burton and Marlon going, you did? And then Marlon found out he didn't. And then Richard Burton, he would say, I've got Clint Eastwood. He, that was his little trick. Yeah. Um, he was very clever. He, you know, for someone that grew up on the streets of New York with absolutely nothing, I don't know, he just had the gift of the gab and he started as an agent and then he went on to, uh, he went on to be, a, you know, the head of Universal, Lou Wasserman chose five of them. And I just think my dad, just he was he was a great bullshit artist, and he loved to swear. I went, me and I'm a girlfriend of mine here, Natasha. We made so much money from our dads in the 70s. I've had probably more money in the 70s and 80s than my bank account, than my than I do now because every other word was a swear word. And it, what really struck me, I'm going to finish here in this movie, was that he the word punk that is not an Alistair MacLean. We do not use that word in England except when we're talking about someone with yeah. hair like that. So I, I reckon Daddy probably said, yeah. let's put, let's tell me he's a little punk, because I used to call, um, he used to call me when I was Sophia's age, you little punk, I had nothing at your age, you little punk. And uh, he, he was desperate for one of us to go into medicine. He was like, you know, my mom had four Any boys. Any of them to be a doctor. He was like, why can't you just be a doctor? I had no money to study when I was a kid. You guys just be a doctor. And we all went in, apart from one brother, we all did go into the film business, so. That's all I have to say now. Over to you guys. Um, we'll we'll oh. go to the far end, and Anthony, um, first assistant director on the film. Um, yeah, this, this is an extraordinary epic film. Could you talk a bit about the production schedule? And, and it, it just feels so complex, something to organize. Well, it was is it operating? Yeah. Is it? It doesn't sound like it is. It doesn't do you sound as. Use my answer. No. I used to work for Anthony Way on the Bond films. It was like one of my first jobs making him tea. <laughs> yes, little punk she was. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, the scheduling, it was, it was quite complicated because um, the, the getting the permissions to blow up what we blew up. I mean, <laughs> you wouldn't do it nowadays. But 
setting up those stunts was quite uh, time consuming. A uh, big deal was to blow up or build and blow up yeah. and prepare them. Um, so, and of course we had the weather con to contend with. Our first day shooting, um, we did the parachute drop and, and uh, we couldn't get up there because the roads were blocked with snow. <coughs> And when we did get up there, the poor parachutists, I mean, two or three of the poor sods got, fell into the trees. And uh, on the second day, I remember one of the guys came down and his chute didn't open or half opened and he had to pull the emergency chute. I can't remember which stunt guy it was now. And he hit the tree and his gun came up and smashed his teeth. Oh so he <laughs> it wasn't a good day for him. <laughs> but. Uh, we did lose um, quite a lot of time through weather, uh, bad, bad weather. Well, it had nothing to do with <laughs> No, on our unit, we, 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 we fortunately didn't have the act only had the actors occasionally. Oh, yeah. No, that was the first unit's problem. Yeah. We had the fun unit. Yeah. We just blew it up. <laughs> well, it's, it's actually quite interesting you say uh, about um, not working with the lead actors because I don't know if uh, many of you know this, but both Richard Burton and Clint Eastwood referred to this film uh, where doubles dare, because there, w there were so many doubles being yeah. used in their place throughout. Watch, watching the film again, uh, I mean, most of that stuff, action stuff, we did. Yeah. And, and the first unit just went in and cut in. Um, although we had to do a lot of it, I think the first unit left Dennis oh, yeah, but the, about halfway through, wasn't it? It was a stuntman's picture. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, uh, I mean, recognising all those old stunt guys now is incredible. But we didn't, yeah. have, we didn't have computers in those days no? where you could just make those stunts happen on a computer. And I wondered, I, I used to ask you, Barbara, do you think one day you won't even have to hire a Bond? You, you can just yeah, use it on, do it on computer and not pay him $20 million? <laughs> well, but the other thing had, was that uh, the stunt... The, the, you you uh, never had safety harnesses either. We never had health and safety, <laughs> mate. No. On those... On those uh, uh, no, I, 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 over <coughs> those... Uh, uh, Lifts and yeah. I mean it was uh, well you couldn't do that. So with, dangerous. Uh, we didn't do it. I mean no one was cabled on there. That was all done for real. I mean. Um, but the the stunt guy that Elliot was dying to work with was Yakima Kanat, who was yeah. born in 1895, and it was just his dream to work with this guy. And both his sons became stunt guys as well. And really the stunts are amazing. I think you, you agree. Well, uh, Yakima Kanat, of course, was a very famous rodeo rodeo uh, exactly uh, a rider. Yeah. Yeah. won awards, yes. and he was became John Wayne's stunt man, yep. stunt double. And John Wayne's walk and a lot of it was inspired yeah. by him. Yeah. Um, a piece of history um, for all of you who've seen Stagecoach, that astonishing sequence where the guy goes under the horses and under the stagecoach and back up the other side, that's this guy who did that. <laughs> yeah, but they had the best stunt men in this country, Alf Joint and uh, Joe Powell, mm -hmm. uh, and his brother, Eddie. Yep. Eddie was the one that jumped from the cable car into the river. Well, and Joe, and, and, Joe. and Alf, yeah, and and uh, what, what was the girl's name? Uh, uh, J Alden, Gillian Alden, Gillian no. Alden. But they had to time that because that was going across the river like that, so it's uh, it was quite yeah. quite a dangerous, very dangerous was stunt. Their breath yeah. on that one. Yeah, I was gonna say, I've read um, with Alf Joint. I read one article. Um, Alf Joint was the guy who gets electrocuted in the bath at the beginning of Goldfinger. Um, but yeah. he jumped from well, he was the person who jumped from one cable car to another, and he lost his front teeth. Yeah. Doing that, where you, where you see Richard Burton's character slam into that cable car, he took his teeth out. So, uh, so thank God lawyers weren't as effective then as they are now. <laughs> actually, actually, you say that, but Daddy's favourite words were "sue me," <laughs> <laughs> and he also said, "Why can't you guys be lawyers or doctors?" He didn't just say doctors. Um, I'm going to bring in Peter Mullins. Wherever he, where are you, yeah. Peter? Oh, you're up there. Right. Um, Peter's the art director on the film. And it, it's interesting, um, you're just saying, Dennis, Hello. that this is a stuntman's film. But what I think is so remarkable, and I think the reason this film deserves repeated viewing time and time and time again, is the centrepiece is in the Great Hall. Yeah. And it's not about action. It's about this incredibly convoluted sequence of double crossing and triple crossing. Um, and I've, I've always been fascinated, um, Peter, by the design of that great hall. Could you, could you talk about it, but the conversations that you had both with Elliot and Brian G. Hutton, the director? Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, fine. Um, not much with Elliot other than don't spend any money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds um, right. <laughs> with Brian, um, I basically made a model 
of it and just showed him and uh, he kind of went along with it. Um, it was based on a castle we saw uh, in Austria when we were looking around. So um, the idea of the, 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 the back of it with the, the, and the spiral staircase, that came from two different castles, actual castles. I, I took photographs and measurements and put them together. And the fireplace is extraordinary in, in that scene. And that was inspired by Citizen Kane. Ah. <laughs> I, I, I always wonder with an art director, um, especially in a film like this, that you spend months thinking about something and coming up with so many beautiful drawings, and then you create it only to see it be destroyed. It must be slightly heartbreaking at some point in time to see this creation suddenly being torn apart. You get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just in terms of, uh, you were saying you're looking at locations, the, the castle that you see in this film... Um, a little bit more background uh, sound of music, the Do Re Mi song where they're having a picnic. You sit in the background, and for anyone who's seen the Man in, Man in the High Castle recently on Amazon, it's um, Hitler's lair. Um, could you talk a bit about the research that you did around finding that castle and just travelling across Austria? Well, I spent three weeks with uh, a German um, assistant driving around looking at castle. We went to Switzerland, we went to Germany, Austria... Um, the first place we went to, we flew into Salzburg, and Elliot had said, go to Salzburg and look at Salzburg Castle, which really didn't work, even though it's a wonderful place. And then somebody said, there's another one outside, about 20 miles outside, which was Werfen. And that was the first one we liked, and then we spent three weeks going all over the place, and ended up going back with the second one we saw. Um, because all kinds of things come into it. You have to think of transport, yep. um, main roads to get your, tra your, your, your extras and your actors and everything there. And knowing it's going to be snowing, that makes it even worse because there's so many problems attached to that. Now, am I right in thinking that um, you sort of tipped out of the season and at one point in time had to replace snow with salt? We did. We did. That sequence where they jump in the river, yep. we had... Um, um, Fire, local fire service um, shooting foam up into the trees. Um, and then it was kind of running down. If you look carefully, you can see it kind of dripping down. And well, not only that, Peter, the, uh, we use so much foam is that the order came down from to stop the fire, fire brigade because the fire brigade was running out of foam. <laughs> the, the other thing was we use so much salt. When they, when they break out of... Um, uh, the garage with the, um, with the truck, with the, with the bus. Uh, we sorted the whole of that village and then it drizzled and rained and that ran down into the local uh, water ducts and down into the river. And all, then all the cattle were then getting ill because they drank so much salt. <laughs> and then the farmers came up, I don't know if you remember Tony, but yeah. the Farmers came up in their carts and things with pitchforks and wanted to start a war because all their cattle were dying. <laughs> and you didn't include that in the film? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the floor. We also it, used Epsom sorry. salts, I think. Oh, we did, you, that's right, we did. Yeah. Um, I'll open the floor in a moment. I've ju I've just talking about preparations and, um, again, outside, if you look at the display outside, you'll see one shot. I wouldn't call it a miniature of the castle, but it's a scaled-down version of the castle, which is quite remarkable. Um, how, how did you, in prep for the film, decide what would be location and what you were going to shoot back in England? And, and did that change at all during the shoot? Well, <coughs> Peter would be more involved in the night. Well, you, that. you go through it with the, with the director. You go on location with the cameraman and the first assistant and, and, and the director, and you work it all out between you. And some things are very obvious. They can't be done on location or they can't be done in the studio. So, you, you know, it's a matter of kind of a going through the script, marking it up and working out what your shots are. But, Dennis, um, just looking at that final chase along the road um, and just the preparation for it must have been insane, of filming it the way that they did. Well, I mean, if you look at any film, it's, uh, it's, it's our scripts that put the camera where the artists are. So all those, all those shots you see on the cable car and all that, we had to put the cameras up there. I mean, they were putting platforms out on top of the cables, on top of the cable cars. Mm -hmm. So 
So you put the camera crew on one side and the grips were standing on the other side to, to balance it. <laughs> so and it, scary. And it, as like I said earlier, there was no tie-ons and elf and safety in those days. It was, it was you know, and the, you've got 60 mile an hour winds going up there and, and you're going up and down. You're doing that for days and days on end. Did no one died on that production, did they? Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, Tony, I think Tony done a lot of that uh, uh, Cobra car stuff with the yes. flight scenes and, and stuff with the second unit. Well, we, <clears throat> we travelled up when we did the cable car exploding on the uh, cable. We had to go up. Uh, they, we started very early in the morning. We sent the cables up to the top with all the staff who had to go to the top and all the provisions. And then we went up with the camera at the first pylon and we got off with the first camera and then they took the cable car back down again and they put a second cable car on the same cable and brought it back up again. So we had it above us and the special effects guys were in the real cable car, the cables, to the explosives in the dummy cable car. And as it came down, we shot it and blew it up. But we stood up there for like five hours and it was bloody freezing. Oh, it makes me, that film makes me cold just watching it. <laughs> but there was a story uh, which uh, should be told about uh, uh, the opening sequence when the parachutes come down. Mm. Uh, Brian Upton wanted a shot through, through oh, the yeah. parachute, <clears throat> uh, looking at the guy coming down. So they had a stump man in there. Special effects built a frame. So they hung, the, hung, hung all the cables yep. to oh, the parachuters. And then they wanted a, a, a cameraman on top of the platform <coughs> looking through the hole, right, so that they get the strings and they get the guy holding on. And in London, when we prepared for all the equipment, all the, all the camera equipment and that, there was one particular cameraman who was going to do that particular shot he was going to sit on this platform and look through, and they take it up by helicopter. So they had the platform attached to an helicopter. So the guy in London got all his gear ready, all his cold stuff, and, and, and when he saw what he had to do, he, he bottled out. He couldn't, he couldn't do it. <laughs> and, there, and there was a very famous uh, cameraman who was a lovely, lovely chap. Ginger Gemmel. Uh, Ginger Gemmel. Yeah. He was a big stout. And he, they talked about the, all the camera crews, uh, no one wanted to do this shot. So he'd done it and saved face. He wanted to save face for the camera crew that were out there. And he'd done it. Anyway, they attached this platform to the helicopter. They got Joe Powell, who's, who's like the best stuntman in, 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 in Europe at the time under the cables and the helicopter took off and they went to about 2,000 feet and it, the wind caught it and it started oh oscillating, it started to go. And the pilot asked the special effects who were inside the helicopter to let them go to release it because the helicopter was doing that. Oh my God. And the ginger passed out, he, he blacked out. I would have. <laughs> I don't know. Did that happen? I don't know. And 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 this guy managed to get the helicopter down. He got it down and down and down. And uh, anyway, uh, they got him out. And and they wanted to do it again. The, the stunt man, <laughs> the, the, stunt man the stunt man, and the operator said yes, we'll do it. And the the, the pilot said no way. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Um, for any, yo, sorry. Can I ask a yeah. question? Do you, did he pass out because he was so scared? Well, he obviously, yeah, I would have been. I would have <laughs> You're doing or this at 2000. Yeah. Yeah. I got the shot, so, I mean, because it's, it's in the film. Well, they come yeah. down. Yes, you see it, yeah. Yeah, yeah but they'd done it, they done it, I think they'd done it about 30 feet wow, above. Yeah. So well. in the film, it's cut short, Yeah. if, if you look at it, yeah. <laughs> Um, for any young people in the audience wishing to break into the yeah, film industry, it's really, really not like this anymore, honest. It's uh, I think we, we, we shot uh, what was scripted the best we could. 
we had to, you always have to adapt on uh, any action film, but I think we um, we got what the script said. I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Um, and I think you had the. I, th I think you had the most underrated director in the world. Oh, yeah. yeah, Brian. Brian Hutton. Yeah. But he went. Uh, he went on to make some good films. He did Kelly's Heroes and and. Think, did you which, do Kelly's Heroes was with um, yeah. Sydney Beckerman? Yeah, I went on that one. It's, it's an interesting comparison with Kelly's Heroes because um, it's a film I very much like. But I, I, I find really interesting that Kelly's Heroes is a film that is absolutely located within the 1960s and is a 1960s Second World War film. What I find interesting about this, and I think it is the combination of a very classical actor and a new style of actor, is that that, that balance in this film doesn't make it feel like a 1960s movie. It, 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 it's, it's, it's certainly not like the 40s Second World War, 50s Second World War films. That's right, yeah. yeah. But it's, it doesn't have that sense of the almost tapping into the late 60s culture that, in a way, Kelly's Heroes has. Yeah, and I've got to mm. tell everybody that Clint Eastwood is the ultimate wonderful actor and person and you couldn't meet a nicer guy in the business. You, you, <coughs> you use a disposable actor. <laughs> <laughs> No, you, you, um, it's a combination of what probably in those days was would have been travelling map, Peter, or uh, before blue screen, wasn't it? Green, green screen? Uh, falling, the body falling off the... Uh, uh, that was blue screen. Blue screen, was it? Yeah. The Donald Houston one, yeah. Don, yeah. yeah. Where it, it, it actually looks quite false, the, the, it falling away. You can tell it's a sort of a... So it, it's partly shot on location and partly shot in the studio's... With a, with a sort of a tracking back to a body falling, diminishing in size. Mm. It, um, just in terms of uh, the visual effects in the film, because there, there was certain matting I could see in, in certain scenes, um, uh, what, how far along were effects at that point in time in the late 1960s? Because I, I wondered if this was quite cutting edge. For well, I think, mm. I think mm. front projection come out just, just after that film. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was quite limited. Yeah, because yeah. Mm. they went from mm. blue screen to green screen, uh, uh, front projection. Uh, which, back projection, uh, then front projection. Yeah. Yeah. Back projection. Well, we done back, back projection, uh, then, then front projection come out. And then they said that would do away with going on location, you just take a picture and you can do it all on the stage. But that never, ever happened. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's that funny they, thing. They use, mm. I mean, for all these flying shots now, they, do in the, they use green screen. It's, it's um, something that Melissa and I were talking about outside earlier, that I think it's having the authenticity of being shot mostly on location, location yeah. is what makes this film so extraordinary. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, a lot of the Bond shot, the Bond yeah, shots but the, are shot in the The cameras I yeah. used in those days, which was the Mitchell BNC, I mean, they were... Enormous. They were that yeah. big. Yeah. I mean, you're getting them through the snow out there. You, I mean, there was no transport. It was on sledges. You were pushing it around. I mean, it was tough. All the track you were laying there, or you'd lay track down and lose it because it was in the snow and you couldn't find it. And I mean, it was a nightmare. nightmare. <laughs> nightmare. I mean, it was tough. It was a tough film. Whereas these days you do an aerial shot and you just need a drone with a little camera attached yeah. to it. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's uh, that easy now. It doesn't look... Th they don't make them like they used to. These films now on these HD, I can't watch them. It's too... But the technology they've got now to make films is yeah. uh, incredible. Mm, yeah. True. But we were lumps of wood and <laughs> string. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and big carrots. I, I think, think it, yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, I, I think they became great friends in the end, but uh, uh, Elliot wanted an American actor for the American audience, basically, so it was written in especially. What, do you, what were you going to say, Dennis? Did well, you want to I, th them? I think it was a toss up with, uh, with someone else. Yes, you're right. But, uh, but Brian Hutton wanted Clint. Well, Clint, yes. And uh, he, He'd only done spaghetti westerns up until and, then. And uh, uh, Richard Burton wanted uh, Mary, Mary Ewer. Oh, yeah. Yes. She so, was a, yeah. so it was a, a thing, well, you have Mary Ewer and I'll have Clint Eastwood. I bet he wanted Mary Ewer. But I, then did, when <laughs> I wanted Mary Ewer. She's a hot little number. And, and the other woman was, <laughs> a, was gorgeous in it, too. Ingrid, yeah. Ingrid, Ingrid Pitt, Pitt. Is, is my kind of hero in the film, just because <laughs> for all this action, everything going on, explosions everywhere, people falling about dying, yeah. she turns up to meet them at the bus with a bottle of alcohol in her hand. How cool is that? <laughs> That's so cool. I just, yeah. Brilliant. So, 
I'd like to know all of your reactions when you first saw the finished version of this film. Let's start with you, Tom. I was flabbergasted. I mean, I, that, it was just more than I ever thought it would be. It's uh, fabulous. I loved it. Yeah. Because I mentioned at the start about the music. The music is just extraordinary in this film. Yeah. It's, it's we played that music at Daddy's funeral. It was a disaster because it was ten years, nine years ago this year. And my brother Carrie was like, we've got to play the Where Eagles Dare music because Daddy was, it was like his proudest production apart yeah. from his family. And uh, Carrie was trying to put it on on a jukebox kind of thing because it was before uh, Apple phones and I, um, you know, whatever the kids have. Like, I'm so not techie, sorry. It was my Siri that went off during the film <laughs> going, what do you want? Um, but, you know, we didn't have that. So we tried to play this thing and it didn't go off very well, but I, I just want to say I, I hadn't seen the film on a big screen, so I just wanted to say thank you so much. I, it, I'd never seen it like this, because yeah. it was made in 68, released in 69. You were born in 72. I, I was born in 72. I'm way too young. Yeah. And, when, and when Daddy would go, it's on this Christmas, or Dylan would say it, or I would be like, oh, God, I, do I have to watch it? So I'm really proud of you, Sophia. <laughs> You're amazing. Yeah. And, and, my, and my boyfriend, Ads, I have to give a shout out. I was a mess today because I hadn't cried when da Daddy died. And today it just came out and yesterday. And Dylan was on the phone with me yesterday and Ads looked after me today. But it, was, it just came out because I was like, he should be here. He would yeah. love, love this. I'm sure he's here. I'm yeah. sure he's watching it all. Yeah. Yeah. Dennis, your, your first reaction. Well, my, my reaction is that, uh, you know, it's a, a great film to do. Uh, I don't think you could, in the whole of the business, I've, 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 I've done a, over a hundred films and I've never worked with anybody like Elliot and, and Brian Hutton uh, together. Yeah. I mean, they treated the crew like friends. You, you talk all day, it, and it doesn't happen on film, you know, yeah. the director sort of But they were childhood back, friends, which was nice. Back, but you've got Clint Eastwood, you've got, you've got Elliot and you've got, I mean, and, 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 and it was a family film. Yeah. It was, you Did know. Richard hang out with you guys, or was he always no, with Elizabeth? No, Richard. Intro? No, Richard always. Because uh, yeah. he, he was a bigger yeah. star than Clint at the time, yeah, right? Well, I mm -hmm. have, yeah, you yeah. couldn't afford to drink with him. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't remember the first time I saw the film, and I. I so you're not that old, mate. I do remember <laughs> um, that I, if I was, I felt quite proud of it. I mean, I was quite impressed with. But, I mean, one sees all the rushes, obviously, so you see your shots. You've seen the shots that you've done. It's just interesting to see how it's all... Because you don't yeah, see what the other unit's doing yeah. mm. and how it all interacts. Yeah, you right. read the script, you know the script. And I think when we saw the film for the first time, it was certainly something to be proud of. Uh, not, or not ashamed of, certainly. <laughs> um, first time I saw it, I was in Australia. And uh, they had a special showing rather like this in, in a bigger cinema. And um, I must say it really kind of surprised me and shocked me and blew me away at the time. And I, I couldn't believe I'd worked on something like that and put it all together, you know, in my department. Kind of and mm. looking at it and thinking, wow, that worked. I didn't think it would or... <laughs> <laughs> it really worked. You know. Actually, why do you think... <laughs> Yeah, there are other films that were made in that era that you know, people talk about and they're popular, but there's something about this film. Yeah, but you know the nice thing, you know the nice thing about it is that, uh, I mean, at our age now, you know, uh, and the younger generation in the film business, and I'm still working in it, uh, and, and they say, oh, you worked on Where Eagles Dare, and they want to know all about it. Yeah. yeah. And, and that doesn't happen with any other film.